Hey, all thank you for joining us here at I-80 Sports. Today, we are previewing the 2021 season for Atlanta United. And we have Jason Longshore from Soccer Down Here. Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and where we can find you? Yeah, I host the Soccer Down Here daily show. You can listen to it um, on our website, soccerdownhere.net. You can also watch on Twitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. Um, I call the Atlanta United matches in MLS for 92.9 The Game here in Atlanta. Uh, color awesome. commentator with Mike Conti and also call Atlanta United two games, uh, the home games anyway, for ESPN+. Plus. So I've been doing all of that since the, the club started in 2017 and this is looking like a year that in a lot of ways reminds me of 2017. It feels like a very fresh start after a, a rough year last year. I think everyone feels that way about 2020 a little bit, even if it's not about <laughs> soccer, kind of that reset button. But let's talk about Atlanta United because what a great soccer culture. They were an expansion team just a couple of years ago, already run an MLS Cup. Let's talk about ownership, stadium, history, Coach, we're going to basket that all up. What do people need to know about Atlanta United? Arthur Blank is the owner. Uh, he owns the Atlanta Falcons as well. And when he became the person interested in bringing MLS to Atlanta, it became a, a real idea. Um, Atlanta was, was mentioned as an MLS city at the very, very beginning, but you didn't have a local owner at the time. Uh, different people popped up with ideas about bringing MLS to Atlanta. You had the Atlanta Silverbacks for a long time here in the second division. People looked at the Silverbacks and, and looked at Atlanta's history in sports and said that MLS wouldn't work here. But Arthur Blank kind of revitalized the, and the Atlanta Falcons when he bought them, made them far more popular. And when he was the guy to jump up and bring soccer to town, he immediately legitimized it. And... People were blown away by the amount of interest because Atlanta wasn't known as a soccer city at that point. And the the early deposit numbers for season tickets, people are like, oh, no, people aren't going to actually buy the tickets. It's just putting down a deposit. Then they kept selling more deposits and kept selling more deposits. Then it's like, oh, no, they're not actually going to convert it. Now people did. And you've got a huge season ticket base of somewhere between 35 and 38,000 people. Wow. With a incredible. large, large waiting list. Uh, I think the waiting list is in the five figures at this point. Um, they play at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which if you remember from 2017, the team started at Bobby Dodd Stadium on the campus of Georgia Tech. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, the stadium got delayed and, and got delayed a couple of times. So had to start at Bobby Dodd, which was a great temporary venue. Um, people were skeptical on how it would work. The field was a little tight, but it had kind of a, a really cool atmosphere. People were right on top of the pitch. And a lot of the traditions that started at Bobby Dodd with people standing, because Bobby Dodd was, I mean, it's, it's an old football stadium. It's metal bleachers. It is like as old as it gets, as basic as it gets. So people stood because you didn't want to sit on a metal bench all day. So people stood. And now they take that to Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which is this beautiful modern venue that really works well for soccer and for the NFL. It was built with soccer in mind from day one. The, 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 the seats retract to make a full-width 75-yard wide field. Um, they constantly add new turf to make it play as well as you possibly can on a non-natural surface. Um, it's just an amazing venue to get to work in, to call games in. And it's worked so well for soccer. like. I think one of the things that, that I look for around the league in terms of, of culture and atmosphere is when I turn a game on before I see it, I want to hear it and know where it is. Like there's some stadiums in MLS that have that. I think Atlanta's one that it sounds like yeah. Atlanta when you listen to a game from here. Um, Portland, it sounds like Portland. It doesn't sound like another stadium. Those are really, really cool to me. And it's a, it's a credit to the the culture here in Atlanta because I think soccer here feels a little different. You know, you, you've got a, a heavy hip hop influence in it. You've got a, an incredibly multicultural fan base. Um, it's, I think, an Atlanta United match when it's packed in the stadium is the most diverse place in the state of Georgia on those game days. It's just an amazing vibe. 
And I can't wait till at some point in 2021, we're able to get that back. You know, that was one of the big missing elements of 2020 was having that atmosphere and having the, the 17s that's become the nickname for the fans because the team started in 17. The team hasn't ever assigned the number 17. They've dedicated that to the fans and, you know, we've always called the fans 17s and to get them back in the stadium, making that noise and, and spurring the team on and making the Benz a really tough place to play. Can't wait for that day. Absolutely. Now you talk about Arthur Blank. And when I think of him, I think of Matt Ryan and just offense, offense, offense. We're big NFL guys. We cover fantasy football. And that was exactly the story for years in Atlanta, where they were a top offensive team with with a striker, Joseph Martinez, who was just taking it to the house all the time on that turf. Gives you a little extra speed. I know you like it to per- compare it to grass. Let's talk about last season, because last season that all kind of fell apart. 6-13-4 in 2020, 23 goals scored and uh, 30 g- scored against. That 23 scored is the second lowest goal total in the league. They were respectable at home 4-4-2. Four, four which led them to be, um, you know, not in good shape. When we look at the goal scores, you had John Gallagher, four goals, Adam Jane, three goals and one assist. Brooks Lennon, two goals, three assists. Ezekiel Barco, two goals and two assists. And Emerson Hindman, two goals and one assist. When you look at 2020 as a collective whole, what is the storyline? What is the feeling? What would you have to say about 2020? Everything changed. Uh, about the 70th minute in Nashville in the season opener when Joseph Martinez hurt his knee. Yep. Um, Atlanta was coming off of a really good couple of games in CONCACAF Champions League where they, they went down to Honduras and, and drew with Matagua, won the second leg comfortably, uh, coming in kind of on a high. It, it was looking really good going into Nashville. You got a couple of early goals. You, you were in a good position in that game, and it was just a fluke thing where – Joseph's on a break, and and you could see his knee buckle when he, he came down on it. And you, you hoped yeah. at that time. It's like, okay, maybe it's a sprain. Maybe it's something minor. Um, it wasn't. And a couple of days later, found out it was the ACL, and he was going to be out for an extended period of time. Everything changed. I mean, you know, MLS is, is a league that if your stars are producing, you can be a top team. If your designated players aren't producing or aren't available – it's tough. And and Atlanta is a team that look, you don't have anybody who wants to be the backup to Joseph Martinez because he's not coming off the field. if He's healthy. And you didn't have that depth at at the forward position. Um, First league game after the injury, Atlanta found a way to win it. They went down to Mexico in CONCACAF champions league and lost three nil to club America. It was a good performance. You hit the bar, I think three times in that game. That was also the night that, Rudy Gobert tested positive and the NBA shut down and everything stopped and coming into the MLS's back tournament. The storyline that we were talking about constantly going into those games was what will Frank DeBoer do up top? What will the attack look like without Joseph? And I don't think he ever really hit on an answer because it changed in each match in those three games. And there were also, you know, at the time you heard whispers, but you didn't really know what the situation was. After the fact, after Frank DeBoer and the club parted ways, after that MLS's back tournament, you had some interviews come out where things weren't great behind the scenes. And, you know, if you're going to make a change, that was the time. Because 2020, at that point, you know, you're, we didn't know what the rest of the season was going to look like anyway. You didn't know, you know, what was going to happen, but you knew your best player was going to be out the rest of the way. So they made the change. Steven Glass came up from Atlanta United 2. I think he righted the ship. I think he kind of got the character of the team back to where it needed to be, being a a scrappy team, being a difficult team to beat, trying to play fast. But it felt like every time you got some momentum, something else would happen. Like Steven Glass won his first game when the league restarted after the MLS's back tournament, a really good win over Nashville, which by the end of the season looked like an even better win because Nashville turned out to be a very good team. Well, then one more game after that, and Al Nasser comes in from Saudi Arabia and makes an offer for Pitti Martinez that you had to take. And you made a profit on Pitti Martinez, who some people felt like underperformed here in Atlanta. I didn't think he was really bad at all. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. Good. He was good. And he's a a unique player. Um, I don't know if he would have worked in Gabriel Heinze's system, but you get the opportunity to turn a profit on a transfer like that. And he gets the opportunity to make 
three to four times what he was making here, you got to take the offer, especially in a year like 2020. So right when Stephen Glass starts to get some momentum, his best player that was available is transferred out. Ezekiel Barco was injured. That's your three designated players. One's gone, two are hurt. And that was what Stephen had to deal with for most of the season. And you didn't really have time to train. Jurgen Dom would come in and he had a hamstring issue, so he couldn't ever really get going. You added another designated player in Marcelino Moreno. Great addition, but he came in you know late in the season, so it took yeah. him some time to get acclimated. It was just a year of stops and starts, and the team had a chance to get into the postseason. They fought the whole way. Uh, I think what Stephen Glass did is he he cleared the decks, like whatever baggage there was from Frank DeBoer's time. I think Stephen got it back to basics. This became a four three three team again. It became a team that would press. It became a team that tried to control games. They just didn't have enough quality in the final third to win games. And to that point, we mentioned now it was a shortened season. Atlanta scored 23 goals total. The average Joseph Martinez total from the previous three seasons was 25.6. So they didn't even do what Joseph, they, the team collectively could not even do what one player w- was. And, and when you rely on a superstar, that's going to happen now. Coach in that Frank DeBoer last year, right. and I, I said this in late in our season, and I still think it's true. If you had Joseph or somebody else score 12 goals, which wouldn't have been a crazy amount in, I think, 23 games last year, if you had 12 more goals, this team would have been a top half playoff team in the Eastern Conference. They were close. You just didn't have any goals. You just didn't have anybody who could put the ball away. I'm seeing right here. I'm I'm already I'm counting the number of one goal losses, and I'm already up to eight, and I haven't reached uh, <laughs> October yet. So yep. definitely could be the team to kind of just flip that switch and get things moving next season. Now I remember two years ago, uh, Frank DeBoer's first game <laughs> at in Atlanta, first home game. I think it might have been his second loss, and I remember watching the fans on one of the uh, YouTube videos just losing their minds like Frank DeBoer wants to play defense we don't play defense in Atlanta that's not and it seems like he just got off to the wrong foot with right away now we have a new coach Gabriel Hines what is he bringing what do we think about his system do you have any insight on what he's going to add to Atlanta next season yeah one thing on on DeBoer I think it became an easy punchline because of his time at Crystal Palace because of his time at Inter about what he was going to do here. 2019, Atlanta United was the second best team in the Eastern Conference. They won the Campiones Cup. They won the Open Cup. They were Eastern Conference finalists, uh, lost on two world-class goals to Toronto. They'd won that. They would have hosted MLS Cup, and I think won it. They were that close in 2019 under Frank DeBoer. It was a little different early on because I think where, where DeBoer struggled was finding the balance between defending responsibly, which is something Tata Martino tried to find a way to do as well, and playing that very attacking style. I don't think he ever found the balance. I don't think he ever got comfortable. I don't think he built the right relationships with the players. And I think he was always kind of running uphill. Gabriel Heinze is very different. Gabriel Heinze is going to come in and be as far to the other side of that defense-offense balance as you can find. He's not a, a wild offensive manager. I, I think that's one thing people have to understand. You go back and look at his stats from Vela Sarsfield, where he had them punching above their weight. He finished sixth and third in the Argentine first division. But that last season, they were scoring about a goal a game. They, they weren't a high-scoring team. They were a great defensive team, but they didn't play defensively. And I think that's the thing that you have to be able to see the difference. Like He wasn't packing numbers behind the ball. They played a very high-pressing, very aggressive style and very disruptive, Um, similar to the Red Bulls in some ways. But the difference is you've also got what we see in MLS with San Jose, where once they get the ball, they want to keep the ball. They want the ball. This is something Gabriel Heinze has said consistently about his managerial style. He wants the ball. He wants to watch his team play. He doesn't want to watch the other team with extended periods of possession. So he's going to be very risky to get the ball back. I think what you'll see with this team is they will cherish possession. 
and you've got players who are wonderful on the ball and they'll they'll be patient when they have it. When they don't have it, the game will speed up from the Atlanta perspective because they will fight to win it back immediately rather than what we saw at times under DeBoer, which was the ball turned over and he wanted them to drop to get behind the ball and right. be secure defensively, which isn't a bad strategy. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of teams do it. He didn't want to risk up high because of, I think, the back line he had. I think the speed he had on the back line. Now you've got Brooks Lennon, who's very fast at right back. You've got George Bellow, who's very fast at left back. You've got Miles Robinson, who's maybe one of the best speed center backs who can cover ground in this league. You've got three guys who, if you play a very high line and the ball turns over, you can recover. You didn't have that in DeBoer's time. You have it now. I think this is going to be a fun team to watch because they're going to make the opponents suffer. They're going to make Absolutely. them suffer chasing the ball, but then suffer trying to play through pressure. Let's pull up the depth chart because we already talked about that back line. George Bellow, Miles Robinson, Brooks Lennon, and I'm going to help, ask for help with the pronunciation. Anton, is it Walkus? Walks. English. Walks. Oh, Walks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's an interesting one in the back line because there's a lot of rumors about a new signing coming. Gabriel Heinze spoke to the media last weekend and said the deal was done. It's not quite done because it hasn't been announced yet. Alan Franco coming yes. in from Independiente. By all accounts, it's done. Um, it'll take him some time to get accustomed to the team, accustomed to the style of play. You have Walks, who's a, a veteran, a young veteran, actually, but a veteran who can play that center back role. George Campbell, who's a homegrown, might also play some in the back in that spot next to Miles Robinson. I think that spot's a little up for grabs early in the season until Franco's ready to go. And we'd be remiss if we talk about this defense without talking about kind of the linchpin behind them. Brad Guzan, that's markered in, you know, you know, etched in steel, uh, one of the best goalies in MLS. What, what does he bring to the team? I think he's still one of the best goalkeepers in MLS. Um, he's going to have some different things on his plate this year. Playing that high line, I think he'll be a little bit higher up. You know, he's never going to be a true like sweeper keeper. He's not going to be Emmanuel Neuer, but he's good with his feet. And what he can do is if you play it the way that you want to here, you want to force the opposition into trying to drop a ball behind the back line that is in between Gazan and the back line. You want to force people to make tough decisions. I think Brad's going to have to be aware of that. He's going to be a little bit more involved in the buildup. But what he brings that's so vital for that group that's young. I mean, Bellow's a teenager. Robinson still was Olympic eligible at 24. Lennon's 23. If it's Franco, he's young. Walks is young. Campbell's even younger. Gazan has about 10 years plus on all of them. His experience will be critical. Communication will be critical from him this year. But more so than usual, his possession work, his work on the ball will be very important too. Absolutely. Let's move up the field and talk about this midfield. Marcelino Moreno. We have him down as the number 10. Behind him, you have uh, Matthias Rizzot, <laughs> Rosetto, Adams, <laughs> and Hindman. You also have Sosa in the mix. Can you talk about how you see the depth chart playing out with the rest of those guys? Yeah, I think it's going to look different than, than the way you guys have it. Um, I think it's going to be flipped. I think it'll be one holding behind two. So okay. it'll look a little bit more like a 4-1-2-3 if you want to go down that road. Sure. Um, Santiago Sosa. Coming in from River Plate, I think he's going to be the main guy in that holding midfield spot. Uh, 21 games at River, uh, played a good bit in the Libertadores for them. Um, he's played some center back. He's played some as a, a hold, an attacking midfielder, too. He's a pretty versatile midfielder. What I've seen, the little bit we've seen, because things have been very under wraps as you get ready for CONCACAF Champions League, the little bit we've seen, Sosa looks like a really comfortable player on the ball and a really smart player for being 21. Um, I think Sosa is that starter from day one. We've also seen a little bit of a surprise coming in, and, and a couple of players have talked about it in interviews we've been able to do. Ezekiel Barco has been playing centrally, and Marcelino Moreno has been playing on the left, which hmm. okay. we, didn't, we didn't necessarily think would happen here. But when you go back and look at it, we've seen Barco play centrally. I like yeah. him centrally. But we usually saw him as a more of a 10 playing in front of two holding midfielders. That won't be the case. He'll have defensive responsibilities playing in that spot. And also Moreno on the left, he played there at Lanús in Argentina a lot before he was moved into the middle. 
And when he came to Atlanta, he played centrally. I think it's going to be pretty fluid. Like if they line up that way, there's going to be times where they flip. It's just going to happen. The other midfield spot of the midfield three is the biggest position battle in the team to me. You've got Emerson Hindman, who is a U.S. Youth International. He's got Premier League experience. Had a, a, a difficult year last year, and, and I think one of the more underrated elements of that that hasn't been talked about enough, you know, there were players throughout the league that, that tested positive for COVID and came down with COVID, and I don't think any of us really know the effects of that. The only player for Atlanta that we definitively know that tested positive because he told us was Emerson Hindman. And he started the season great. He had a couple of goals early. He was looking really good in the way Frank DeBoer had the team playing before the shutdown. He never found that form again. And I don't know if COVID affected him. I don't know if it kind of affected his lungs. I don't know how it affected him, but we know he had it. He's got a big year in front of him because the way that Gabriel Heinze wants to play, I think it really suits Emerson Hindman's game, but he's got to produce more in the final third because he's going to have opportunities. You, know, you think of Manchester City and those attacking eights. Mm. Heinz can be one of those attacking eights, and, and he sees the game well. I think he feels the game well, but you've got to get the production out of that role, and that's going to be the key. He's going to be battling out with Tyler Wolf, who's a homegrown, who is playing more in that role than playing up top. He's going to be battling it out with Mateo Sosetu, the Brazilian, who's had an injury in preseason. He went back to Brazil for a personal matter. He hasn't been with the team in the last week. Uh, he's going to be behind everybody else when he does come back. So I don't know what his availability is going to be early in the season. Mo Adams had sports hernia surgery, so he's still recovering. I think Mo Adams is a guy who Gabriel Heinze will really like. More of a defensive option, but he's got that range to play that eight role and be a, a kind of a disruptive player in the press. Franco Ibarra is that as well. He came over from Argentinos Juniors at 19 years old. He's only got 11 games at the, the first division senior level with Argentinos Juniors. But he's a, a really good, active, defensive player. He's got quality on the ball. He can play that eight role. He could play the six role. But he's a hard tackler. He's a guy who will get stuck in. He'll break up plays. I think what Gabriel Heinze will have out of that midfield three is a lot of different ways to line it up depending on the opponent. And I think we'll see a lot of changes throughout the year depending on who you're playing and depending on who's in form because he's got a lot of depth there. Well, I, I, got a, I got a quick question. You mentioned Barco moving into the center. Uh, he came into the league with a lot of fanfare, big transfer coming in. Do you think now with the new coach and a lot of Argentine-type players, bring, is this the year he's going to break out? And possibly, you know, he's mentioned he's always mentioned he wanted to go to Europe. Is this the year that Barco's going to break out? If he stays healthy, yeah. Uh, I think okay. when he's had extended runs of staying healthy, he's been one of the most talented players in the league. It's just those runs have been few and far between. Um, the the two that I think of specifically, the beginning of 2020, where he was playing in a role yeah. pretty similar to this, and it was a three four two one kind of shape. But him and, and Pitti were in a free roll behind Joseph in those CONCACAF games. Yeah. Loved, loved how it looked. I think yeah. it was really good. I remember. Play. I remember. He's, yeah. He's they, been one of those guys where his stat line has never been impressive over any game stretch, but he passes the eye test. If you watch him play, yeah. you, you know what he brings. Just like we talked about with Heinemann, you got to have a little more production. And, and I think for him, it's the consistency of playing. If you go back and look at the highlights on him, in 2019, in a run of games where he scored a, a Golasso in New England, uh, one of the best goals I've seen in an Atlanta United match, he scored a great goal in Kansas City, and then he went to the U-20 World Cup with Argentina and played really, really well. Everybody's excited for the second half of the year. He comes back and he plays in an Open Cup game and gets whacked on the knee, off the ball, on the sideline, and he was never the same the rest of 2019. It really bothered him. Last year, he had a quad issue that just he couldn't ever quite get right. He was missing games, and people were wondering what was going on. He had a quad issue that he just couldn't play comfortably. He'd, he'd train one day. Next day, it would feel off. Then he'd, he'd play, and it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be right. It took him so long to get back. This year, if he stays healthy in that role and with Gabriel Heinze coaching him, I think the sky's the limit, but he's got to stay healthy. 
I agree. Let's move up to the final position and let's talk about the forwards here. Because you do have Joseph Martinez and behind him, Lisandro Lopez, who was brought in in this offseason. My question is going to be, what could we realistically expect from Joseph Martinez coming back? Is is he going to score 30 goals again next season? Or is he maybe one of those more 15 is a, is a good, solid number? How do you think and, and talk about where, how those forwards are going to break down throughout the long season? It's a huge question on Joseph because you're coming back from an ACL and, you know, he's been an explosive player. So, you know, does he have that now? It's been now today um, over 12 months since the surgery, uh, 12, maybe like 12 and a half months, which is a pretty long time. Um, the way the calendar kind of worked out, I think it's helped him recover. I think he'll be you know closer to full strength by the time we start than he would have been in a normal MLS season. But we haven't seen him in a competitive game since Nashville on February 29th last year. So what does it look like? You know, does he have any issues? He's a confident guy. He's a guy with a ton of swagger. I don't think he's a guy who will be tentative, but will he trust the knee? How long will it take for that to happen? These are the things we just don't know until we see him in competitive action. I think he will be a guy who leads by example. I think he's a guy that you're looking for 20 goals a year out of. I think that's kind of the the bottom line for him. I think this is a team you'd like to get into that 60 goal a year range. And if he gets you 20, you feel pretty good about it because he's also going to have that positional gravity where he, he attracts attention even when he's not scoring goals. And that's going to create space for the wide players. Um, you've got Jurgen Dom on that list. I think the right wing is his. And if he can stay healthy with his pace, um, he was really dangerous at times last year. He's such a good 1v1 player. Yeah. And the way that Gabriel Heinze plays, he wants to create 1v1s for the wingers. With Dom on one side and Moreno on the other, you have two of the best dribblers in the league on either flank. And if they get this concept of the positional play and spreading the field, they're going to have 1v1s against outside backs a lot this season. And you're going you're gonna to either get crosses in, find Joseph on passes, or you're going to earn fouls. And it's a really good opportunity for this team in the final third. I don't think you need Joseph to do everything, but you need him to be dangerous for this team to be as good as it can be. Couldn't agree more. So my final kind of, as we're winding down here, we talked about the stars to watch. Are there any up and comers or any players that we haven't talked about yet that you think have a chance to be every game contributors, especially in what you assume is going to be a heavily rotated roster this season? Yeah, we went through a bunch of them in the depth chart. Um, one that we didn't mention is Machop Chol, who is a homegrown signing out of Wake Forest. He was with the Academy in, in year one of the Academy, then played four years at Wake Forest. And he comes back to Atlanta as almost like a completely different player. Um, he's six foot four. He, he's oh. very fast. Uh, he's originally from the Sudan. He was born in the Sudan, came to the U.S. at a very young age as a refugee. And he, one, he's just a great kid. And he's a kid that I've known for a long time in the Atlanta area. And he's really matured during his time at Wake Forest. Uh, the coaching staff there did an amazing job with him. And he's went from being just a, a dangerous 1v1 player. And back to the 1v1s, that's, that's an element here that he's going to really get Gabriel Heinze's attention with what he can do in those situations. But he's adding more to his game. Some people would look at this as a negative comparison. I don't at all. He reminds me of young Breck Shea, mm. where Breck Shea, when he came into the league, you go back and remember those days with Dallas. He was an MVP yeah. candidate. Yes. He was tall and fast and really difficult to defend because you'd feel like you could get to the ball and his legs were so long he could make that move around you. Machope kind of has that feel of defenders just looking at it like, how do I even stop him? And if he can continue to build confidence, Machope could be a real surprise that nobody saw coming. Um, the other young guys we mentioned, Ibadra, I think will play some significant minutes. I think George Campbell is a really promising center back that last year hurt him because he didn't get minutes in MLS and he didn't get the opportunity to go down and play in Atlanta United 2 in USL. He needs games this year. He's got so much potential kind of like a young Miles Robinson. He's that kind of player. Good on the ball, big, strong, fast. And I think he's got that 
kind of mentality. Uh, maybe it's, he's got a little bit more of a mean streak than Miles Robinson had when he broke in. I think Campbell, if he gets the opportunity, could be a guy to watch for sure. And I expect George Bellow to continue to grow and grow and grow. I like him. I like him. I really do. I really like him. Yeah. American who goes to Europe. Uh, I really think if if Brian Reynolds is getting the attention that he got, George Bellow is going to get a big offer here pretty soon from a European club, a major club. I like that a lot. So let's. You've been pretty level with us the most of the time. I, I assume you're more of a realist, but I'm going to ask you to put on your your supporter hat for a minute there, supporter scarf, and give us. Give us the optimist side. What what could this team accomplish, and what would it take to get them there? I think they can win MLS Cup. I do. I, I think it'll be a lot like 2017 in that if you go back to that first year for Atlanta United, early on, I mean, it's a brand new team. It's a, a new league for almost everybody. It was you'd have a great performance. You go to you, the first game, you lose to the Red Bulls. Looked like maybe the moment was too big for this group. Second game, there's a bunch of questions. You're playing in the snow in Minnesota, and you got a bunch of South American guys that you're like, oh, they can't play in the snow. And you win 6-1, <laughs> and Joseph has a hat trick. Uh, and you'd have performances like that. Then you'd follow it up with a, a kind of inexplicable loss to D.C. And it was just up and down, up and down. But by the end of that year, when they moved into Mercedes-Benz Stadium, they were wrecking teams. You had the 7-0 over the, the Revolution, you had a 4 0 over the Galaxy. I mean, you were just dominating teams for a stretch. And you kind of ran out of gas going into the postseason. But when people were talking about that playoff going into it, when the, the bracket was set up, people said Atlanta's a team who could surprise everybody and win it. I think this is what that year could be in 2021 is kind of up and down early. You're going to still be getting used to the system. You're going get, to be getting used to a new manager. He's getting used to the league. You got a bunch of new faces. You're building chemistry. It's still weird with COVID and and a pandemic and all these different things. It will be up and down. You'll see some really good results that you think this team can't be beaten. And you'll have some that you'll be like, how did they play that badly? That's going to happen. But I think by the end of the year, they will be a legit title contender. I think they have the talent to do it. And I have a, a lot of hope about Gabriel Heinze as a manager. I think he's going to be a guy who's really well suited to this league. And I think the ideas that he has are going to be really interesting to watch. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun year. No matter what the results come out as, I think it's going to be a really fun year. And hey, 2017 ended a little bit earlier than we hoped in Atlanta. 2018, you lifted MLS Cup. I could see that trajectory for this group. I have a quick question before we have the show. I, we, yeah. I always ask uh, you know, everyone who comes on our show, your most hated rival, I'm assuming, is Orlando. Tell us why they're your most hated rival, why your supporters hate them. It's funny. like uh, The Atlanta United fans don't want to admit that Orlando's a rival um, because up until this past year, Orlando had never beaten Atlanta. So it was always the like, well, they've never won, so it's not a rivalry. I always disagree. That game had feeling to it. It, it had animosity from day one for a lot of reasons you had fan groups that had gotten into skirmishes beforehand before the team even existed bunch of nonsense like that you had tifos back and forth you had some incidents in the first meetings between the two teams but you also had some great games and it was always competitive with those two even when orlando frankly wasn't very good orlando is the team that has the most I think animosity, like I feel up for it. It's the the place that when we go and call a game from Orlando, it's the place that we have to be a little bit careful with the dump button on crowd noise because we've been called a few things from uh, the fans in front of us. Um, I've had people text me like, are you okay? Are you safe? <laughs> it's been like that. But I love calling games from Orlando because of that, because it's got a vibe. Right. Right. It feels like, okay, this is a little, a little edgy. I like it. But I think Atlanta has a few rivals. I, the like Red Nashville, Bulls, I was gonna say. I was gonna say Nashville too might be a territorial yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, it will be. I think Nashville. Last year we'd be further along if you had the back and forth with fans. I mean, there were probably out of fifty nine thousand in Nashville for opening night. I'm gonna say twenty were from Atlanta. Wow. I mean, it was a huge away crowd. And I think you'll see the same when Nashville comes down to Atlanta and you have full venues. That'll be exciting when Charlotte comes in next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. 
Charlotte's already come in and and talked about how they want to you know upstage Atlanta. So you've got that aspect. But then you have Red Bulls with that playoff series in 18. Mm. Always a tough game for Atlanta mm. against Red Bulls. Yeah. New don't York remind Green me. Don't, don't, don't remind us. We're both Red Bull season ticket holders over here. Yeah, oh. But you guys always win except for that playoff. Yeah, like, well, when, it, when it matters. <laughs> except exactly. when it actually yeah. mattered. Oh, yes, when it that matters. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, when it matters. You know, we change our tactics all of a sudden and look what happens. Yeah, every uh, time. <laughs> that's the one that's got to drive you guys crazy. Because oh, oh, yeah. That's the game that, like, MLS Cup in 2018, I wasn't ever super worried. It was after the game against Red Bulls at the Benz that I'm like, this team's going to win it because of how they played and how they killed the game off at the end. The goal from Vijalba at the very end Mm. sealed it. it. And, And then the second leg, I mean... You know, we're there. Atlanta didn't really have to play. They didn't have to do anything. It was just kind of a nothing game, just riding it out. And you go to MLS Cup against Portland, riding off of that, because that was the game that the Benz was the craziest pregame because of that hatred for the Red Bulls, because yeah. the Red Bulls had had Atlanta's number. And honestly, they still have Atlanta's number, except for that series. That's it. <laughs> The most important series, but that's it. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's fun because I, I think the way I see it with Atlanta United and rivalries, I come at it from a little bit of a college football mentality. I went to UGA, I went to Georgia, and it felt like Georgia has a rivalry game every other week because Auburn's a rival, Florida's right. a huge rival, Georgia Tech's a rival. Um, South Carolina's a rival. When they play Clemson, that's a rival. Tennessee's the one I hate the most, and that's a rival. That's like half your schedule. Atlanta United kind of has that feeling. Maybe they replace Seattle in everybody else's hated team. Yeah, and, it's, I've heard that. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. You know, yeah. if Atlanta's the the NWO of MLS, that's cool. <laughs> um, I think LAFC's kind of become a little bit of that for some people. So maybe it's yeah. split. But Atlanta's a team that a lot of people don't like. So you, you get this animosity in a lot of weeks. And I, I think the team feeds off of it. And that's why I can't wait for the fans to come back. And we get cursed out from Orlando fans and other fans around the league <laughs> because it's a lot of fun. And it adds to the the competition. I think we need more of that around MLS. Well, we can't wait to get in the stands to, to curse you out in person. So uh, before <laughs> we go. All in good fun. Before we go, uh, let us know again uh, a little bit about yourself, where we can find your work. Yeah, you can follow me on social media at Long Shoe, my last name, take the R out. Um, you can follow our show, Soccer Down Here, um, at Soccer Down Here on social media. You can follow us on Twitch, um, Soccer Down Here, twitch.tv slash Soccer Down Here. And you can listen to our radio broadcast, myself and Mike Conti. Um, on the new um, Odyssey app, the former or the radio.com app. Odyssey is the parent company now, but radio.com, uh, it's not geo blocked. So if you want to hear Mike and I going nuts during Atlanta United games, uh, we get picked up by Sirius XM a, a fair bit, but you can go to the radio.com app and listen. You can go to the 92.9 The Game website and, and listen. And we try to keep it entertaining and, and tell the story of the team. And yeah, we come from a, a fan perspective. We, we try to have fun with it, and um, usually Atlanta United games are a lot of fun. I think this year it's going to be back to the, that kind of feel. These are going to be games that, whether you're an Atlanta United fan or not, it'll be a team I think you want to watch because it'll yeah. be a, a fun watch in 2021. Absolutely. Again, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time out to be here today, and thank you all for watching ID Sports.